I'm coming to y'all from my home sewing studio here in North Central Florida, where it was chilly this morning and now it's warm. <laughs> because the sun has clearly come out. So I hope all of you are doing well. Let's go ahead and make sure that everything is working. So if you can see me and hear me, go ahead and just put in uh, the chat box, whether you're on Facebook or YouTube, and let us know where you are watching from, okay? Let's see who we have on here. Hey, Margie from Wisconsin. Uh, hey, Sheila tuning in from Rockport, Massachusetts. She says, I'm glad Whip Wednesday is back. I'm glad to be back as well. All right. Hey, Barb, tuning in from California. We got Patricia in the house from sunny Phoenix. Miss Linda from Kansas is on. Awesome. And Deborah from Port St. Lucie here in Florida. Okay. Hey, Laura from Oregon. All right. So what I am going to be talking about today is, do y'all recall last year? Was this last year or 2020? I can't remember when I shared my little rounded, um, a drawstring pouch. I pulled out the drawstring on this one because I do want to feature a product that helps with feeding through, uh, feeding things through a casing, whether it's a ribbon, a drawstring, cording, or whatever it may be. So what we're going to do today is take this little pouch, which has tons of uses, of course, but it's kind of small. So if you're wanting to take the same type of a project using the same pieces, same, um, you know, casing, the same construction for it, but making it bigger, then you'll definitely want to keep watching because I'm going to share with you a little bit of kind of how to make it, but also like the design behind it so that you can make it pretty much any size. Okay. So let's go ahead and switch over to my over the shoulder camera here and I can go over the pieces and stuff that I have on hand. Now, one thing I also want to mention is that we have added a featured category to our online shop. So if you've never shopped with us before, we have an e-commerce shop with hundreds of physical products and I think almost 70 digital courses right now. That can be found on our website at craftygemini.com. There's a shop tab and that's where you'll see everything that you can buy from us, whether it's digital or physical product. But now we have a little menu that says featured. So when I do a Whip Wednesday demo like this, we are going to tag the different products, courses, things, anything that has to do with what I'm talking about today so that you have one clean page to access it on. Okay. So on the featured tab, we're going to be, you know, we have the interfacing, the little bodkin tool that I'll be talking about in a minute. But let's go over what we're doing, how big we're going to make it, and what I used as my template. Okay, so this is the original one, and I included the link to the step-by-step -step video tutorial. This is a free tutorial on how to make the little pouch with the drawstring up top. Uh, how to make it, it's a free tutorial on my YouTube channel, The Crafty Gemini, but I want to make it a little bit bigger because I want to use it like for a little project bag. I've used the smaller ones to hold uh, my hand-knit sock projects because I typically make shorty socks and they're little, so they fit in here. You can use them for like feminine hygiene products, lip gloss, little pouches to give as gifts, and so you can imagine that you can just increase the uses if we make it a little bit bigger. So what I used as my template was just a plate. And this one, I measured it across and it was about 10 and an eighth inch. So this is my Crafty Gemini 5 inch by 10 inch ruler. And you can see that it pretty much, if I put it here at the halfway point, this is about 10 and a quarter inches across. Okay. So you can use a nine inch plate, a 10 inch plate. If you have a larger one, 12 inch, make it any way you want, any size you want. But this is how I use it as my template. Okay. I went ahead and cut out the exteriors already, and I'm going to cut out the lining pieces so I can show you exactly how I used that plate to create my template. But this is what we want to get. Okay. After we're done. So these are my two exterior for the lining fabrics. I just roughly cut two squares of whatever the lining fabric is. I'm going to place it on my Martelli roundabout. Y'all know I love this thing. It is pricey, but it's totally worth it. And when you start making things that feature rounded corners or things that you need to trim close at a curve, it's amazing. All right. So I'm just going to flip this down on top of my fabric. So when I say rough cut, that means take whatever plate you're going to use as your template and just roughly cut scrap fabrics that are a little bit bigger. Okay. Couple ways you can do this. You can hold this down and take a fabric marker and mark around it and then carefully cut with your scissors. I'm doing it so I cut both circles at the same time. So I don't really want to pick this up. I'm going to keep the plate down on here. And I have two rotary cutters on hand. If you have the 45 millimeter, you could use it. Because the blade is bigger, sometimes you won't be able to get tighter curves depending on the size of the plate that you use. So what I often use whenever I'm working with curves is my little 28 millimeter Ulfa rotary cutter. So I'm just going to cut around it. Okay. I'm going to press down 
and I'm keeping my left hand on here so that I don't slide the plate. And I'm just going to do it following the curve. And this is where this rotating mat really helps because whether you're left-handed or right-handed, just cut as far as you can go and it feels comfortable. And I've cut up to about here. I'm just going to turn it, pick up where I left off, and do that in smaller bits until I work my way all the way around the plate. And I think you would agree that a plate is a way easier template to cut around, especially for a circle, versus a paper template or cardstock. Like this is raised up and it gives me more to pull or more to push down on. So now I'm just checking. I'm going to tug on all the sides and make sure that I put enough pressure to cut around everything. And if I didn't, just go back in. Oh, I haven't even finished cutting around the circle. I thought I was done. <laughs> I have a whole chunk here that I didn't even do. Okay, that's why it wouldn't come up. So then keep your hand on that plate because if I go to pull this up and the whole thing doesn't come up, then I know I don't have to try and reposition the plate. I just go back in and cut in whatever little bit didn't come up. All right. So now that's waste. And here are our two circles. All right. Now, as you notice, we need to take a chunk off because we need a straight top here for the casing part. So what I did for this size, if you recall from this tutorial, I think I trimmed off just one and a half inch because the circle was so small to begin with, okay? Because this is a little bit bigger and I don't want to have like a big bulky thing here at the bottom of my bag and like a small little casing, right? Because the less I take off from this edge, the shorter my opening will be. And if you have a larger bag, you want a larger opening so you can fit whatever it is that you want to put in there. So for this size, I decided to trim off two and a half inches off the top. So all I'm doing is taking my ruler and finding the two and a half inch line on the ruler, which for me is right here, this dashed line. One, two, two and a half. And I'm placing that two and a half inch right on one of the sides. So right here, keep the ruler nice and straight and then I'm just gonna cut this off. And if you wanna double check, well, I'll show y'all because I already cut the exterior. So if I place this exterior over the lining, it should be exactly what I'm gonna be left with when I make this cut. So that looks good. Whoop. And I'll show you what I cut off so you can see the amount. So that's the sliver that I chopped off of the circle, okay? So you can see how, let me make sure, one, two, ooh, I was off by a little, two and a half right here. Remember, Measure twice and cut once. One, two, two, and one, two, two and a half. So many little lines are getting me confused on the mat too. So just double check, make sure you have everything where it's supposed to be. Okay, again, double check. One, two, two and a half. Looks good. Now I'm going to make the cut. And I'm cutting through both circles because I cut both circles at the same time, right? So this is waist. And then I have my two lining pieces. Let's just double check them with the exterior and they match. Okay, we're good. So we have two exterior, and that just means whatever fabric you wanted to use for the exterior. We have two cut the same way of the lining. Now we need to cut some interfacing that will give a little bit of added body to the exterior fabric only. You can add interfacing to the lining if you want, but we all know these interfacings can be pricey and uh, you don't really need to be doubling up on it, okay? Oh, thank you, Mary. She says, I appreciate that you explained the why to what you're doing. Absolutely. As a teacher, I feel like that's part of it, right? There's no sense in guiding you blindly into following these steps without you understanding what it is that you're doing. <laughs> so I'm taking one of my exterior template pieces and I'm placing it on top of my interfacing. Now the interfacing I'm using, we carry in the shop. It's also in that featured page on craftygemini.com slash shop and it's fashion fuse. This is a hundred percent cotton woven fusible interfacing. If you're a bag maker, you have a ton of this, I'm sure. You know exactly what it is. It's a big sheet of like a thin cotton muslin that one side just feels like cotton fabric and the other side is a little bit scratchier because it has tiny dots of adhesive, which is what allows us to fuse it to the back of our fabric. So because of that, you wanna make sure that the back or the wrong side of your fabric is touching that scratchier side because the glue is here and that's gonna get glued to the wrong side. You don't wanna do it backwards, okay? So I just roughly cut a couple pieces of the interfacing. I'm going to place my exterior fabric on top and then take that same little rotary cutter because we still got curves here and I am just going to carefully cut around. 
Again, using my Martelli roundabout, I can just spin it and you see I don't even have to hold it. I can just turn it and do little chunks at a time. We also have some of these back in stock. I know we were out of stock of them for several months last year, but we did get some more Martelli roundabouts and it's a rotating cutting mat and then underneath is a pressing mat. So you'll see how I end up using that part in a bit when I fuse this on. So we'll just turn, turn. And the reason I like to cut the interfacing to match the piece is because when you go to fuse it, if you have any bit of interfacing sticking out like this, remember that the glue is going up because it's touching the wrong side of our fabric. So if the glue of the adhesive side of the fusible interfacing is facing up, but you don't have fabric on top of it, you can probably guess where that glue is going to stick to the bottom of your iron, right? So just make sure that you trim this up. Okay, that's one, and I leave it just like that. The interfacing is done correctly so that once I cut the second one, I can just fuse them. All right. <clears throat> Let's see. Oh, Linda says, thanks a lot. I love these bags. She says she's made many of the little ones. Awesome. I love to hear that. All right. Okay. Next one. Let me cut this quickly. And remember that there's a full free step-by-step -step video tutorial on how to make the smaller version. So if you go by the measurements that I'm talking about here for using the same size, about a 10 and a quarter inch plate, you could do that. If you have a larger plate, go ahead and use it. And I'll talk a little bit about the casing so that you know what measurements to go with even if you're starting off with a larger or even a smaller circle than I'm demoing here. All right. Oh, and I think, you know what, we didn't add this fabric to the featured list, but I think we do have some yardage left on a bolt of this super cute spool fabric. So if you are looking for some of this fabric, uh, if you go to craftygemini.com shop, just click the tab that says fabric and you should be able to find this one in there. I think it's like blue yonder something something or the other. I don't know if that's the line or uh, it's probably the line from the designer. Okay. Oh, Susie's asking, can you layer the six pieces and cut ones? Absolutely, if you have a fresh blade on your rotary cutter and you have a really good way of holding them down. The only downside to cutting so many layers at once is that things can move on you. And so if you're aiming for accuracy, it's always gonna be easier to cut one layer at a time. I think in this case, two layers is fine, but more than that, you may wanna just double check and make sure that everything came out the right size instead of having any slippage going on, whether it's with the plate or holding some other template as you cut, okay? So just be careful of that. Wow, Carol says, I've made about 50 of the smaller ones and have given them away as gifts whenever the need comes up. So she's talking about the little one that we are making a bigger version of here today. All right, so we got interfacing cut to match the exterior. Let me make sure my iron has kicked on. I already have some water in here because I was um, steam pressing some other things. So I'm just going to make sure that this is fully aligned. And you saw how I just took off the cutting mat portion of the mat. And now this is a pressing surface that is still on the same rotating base. So you have that option. And again, this is a Martelli roundabout. It's a three piece roundabout mat. It's like a cutting and pressing system. It's pretty cool. And we do have these in the online shop. We actually do have them in stock right now. So I'm just pressing. You may want to read the manufacturer's instructions if you're using a different type of cotton woven fusible interfacing. This Bozel product we've used for almost 10 years now. So I know that steam pressing it really, really works well for me. And I have my iron set to the hottest setting. One, because the fabric side that I'm pressing on is cotton, but also because the Fashion Fuse is also a cotton woven fusible interfacing. So because it's cotton, I can also press from the back side or the interfacing side, where you know if you use a polyester or a synthetic interfacing, like a fusible batting that's not cotton, you won't be able to do that. So I think that's just a little tip important to note on this product as we use it. And that can come in handy. Say you're using a fabric for the exterior that has like metallic or something shiny on it. Sometimes, some of you may have experienced that you hit that with your iron and it kind of pulls up all that metal, you know, that little metallic kind of glittery stuff that may be sitting on top of the fabric on some more decorative prints. And so if you want to avoid that, one way to do this step would be to just flip it over so that you're not directing the heat of your iron right on the metallic um, a design or fancy elements of the fabric, but instead you're pressing it from the fashion fuse side, okay? And so then that would also work. 
So I like to keep those types of tips around because sometimes you don't even think about it. You think, oh, it's a quilting cotton, it's cotton fabric, I can do that. And then you press it and then the heat pulls off all the fun glittery bling of your fabric. Okay. All right, so let's see. Okay. All right, so we have the two exterior parts. This is going to be the shape of the bottom of our drawstring, of our little round drawstring bag. We have the two lining pieces. Now let's move on to the little strips at the top of the casing. So if you recall, we started off with the plate as our template. I cut it out of the fabric fully round. Then I trimmed off two and a half inches off the top of the circle. Okay, so now... And, and this, I'm showing you kind of the design part of it so that if you're making it a different size, this is what you would do as well. Figure out, you know, how much you're going to trim off the top so that you have a decent space here for opening the bag with the drawstring. And then we're going to measure this. So mine measures eight and three quarter inches across the top. Okay. Is that right? Hold on. One, two, eight and three quarters. Okay. So I'm going to just go down by a quarter of an inch of what that measures. So down to eight and a half, and that is the length of the strip that I'm going to cut. So let's grab our cutting mat. So the strip for the casing and the part that I'm cutting out now is going to be this little strip. This is a little tunnel here that we're going to run the drawstring through. Okay. So this, I just said eight and a half. So I've cut it to two inches. So a two inch strip by eight and a half inches in length. So this is my five inch by 10 inch um, Crafty Gemini ruler. And I have this set up and the numbers and the gridded lines and everything so that you can count up in both directions. So if I lay it down this way and I need eight and a half, I know that having this corner here, I go one, two, three, four, five, all the way up to eight, eight and a half. And because I'm right-handed, I can position this here and just make the cut easily without having to like count backwards or having aligned it with different numbers. So eight and a half is one. Here's the other one that I did. So now we need to turn it into something like this. First step is to flip your little casing strip, pretty side of the fabric facing down, and I'm gonna turn under the short ends by a quarter of an inch and press. And if you have your clapper, go ahead and use it. Turn it to the other side while I leave that there, and I'm gonna do the same thing to the other side. And you would do this to both of your strips, okay? I've already done one, so. Now we're going to stitch this. So I'm going to take it to the sewing machine and top stitch this little turned under hem that we just did an eighth of an inch over, just here and here. And there's no need to back stitch or anything like that. We're basically stitching just to hold down that little turned under edge. Okay. And the stitch length can be longer, 2.8, 3.0. It's really just a way for you to keep that down. I'm going to turn it over and do the same thing. Okay. So that's one. Trim away these thread tails. And these little thread snips are in the shop too. I believe we did put them up on the featured page. So if you need little thread snips, these are super handy too. All right, now the next step is to flip it pretty side face down and we're gonna fold it in half to create that casing, okay? Let's fold it here. Just matching the raw edges at the top. And we are expecting some more clappers in stock. I know that we're sold out right now, but I did place an order. So you can add yourself to the wait list, or if it says back ordered, you can order. And then as soon as they're in inventory again, we can ship them out. But these are an amazing little just hardwood tool that helps you set your creases in place, okay? So it comes in super, super handy. All right, let's see. Um, Anita says, I also put a bit of seam tape. So I'm assuming you're talking about holding things in a few places. So if you had like a wash away wonder tape, which is something we carry as well in our online shop, you can put a little bit underneath here. For this kind of thing, it's not really necessary. And you know, sometimes those little double-sided tapes can add a little bit of bulk. One thing you can do is use a little dot of glue, like washable Elmer's glue, and just put it underneath there when you fold it and press it, and that will help keep it down. It's still gonna be somewhat temporary. If you plan to wash it, I would still go in and do the top stitching though, because if you wash the project, then that folded edge, even if you glue basted it, will lift up and can bother you like at the drawstring ends because it'll keep lifting up. So that's why I just take that 
you know, a couple seconds just to quickly press that into place. Okay, so now let's move on to placing the casing where they need to go. So we have one there. Let's just double check that I cut and sewed everything precisely. They both should be the same length. That looks good. So the next step is to take one casing and align. Make sure y'all can see me here, huh? Does everything still look good? Okay. So that you can align the raw edge of the casing strip with the raw edge here, but it needs to be centered. And the most accurate way to quickly center these two different pieces of fabric together is to locate the center of each, and then you place the center of one on the center of the other, and they're gonna be perfectly centered without having to do any math, okay? So the way to do that is to fold this exterior in half at the top, I'm matching the edges, and I'm just gonna scratch it at the top right here, and that little fold and mark that I just made is gonna be my center. You can mark it with a fabric tool or chalk if you need to see it a little better. Then if I do the same thing to my casing strip, fold it in half and scratch it, I can now align the halfway point of this on the halfway point of this let me grab some pins. Whoops. Post-it notes everywhere. And then you can pin them together and that's gonna be centered. What that's gonna do is allow us to have the same amount of fabric on either end, okay, of the casing. So, I mean, you can put more pins if you feel like you need it, but it's such a narrow strip, I don't really think I need any more. We'll do the same thing to these two. Scratchy scratch at the middle. You can mark it if you need to. Same thing to this one. Just make sure that you have them properly folded in half because otherwise, yeah, you're going to get a crease there, but it might not be exactly in half. And that crease is here. So one on top of the other. Raw edges of all the layers aligned. And I'll put my pin. When I'm working with fabrics by themselves, like quilting cottons with some of the light woven fusible interfacing, I prefer to use pins. If you prefer to use the plastic clips, you can do that too. And I'll just grab a couple here to show you. I don't like to use these when I'm working with thin layers because I feel like they're heavier than the fabric layers themselves. So that's, that is an option though. If you have problems, you know, inserting and taking out pins or you just want to use this easier, or maybe you're teaching a kid or a beginner to sew, it's a lot easier to not have them poking themselves <laughs> as they complete the projects at every step, right? So these clips do come in handy as well. All right, let's see. Uh, Marlene is asking, where do I buy the fine metal tip for my glue bottle? So my friend Laura, she has an Etsy shop called Dragonfly Quilt Works. So if you go on Etsy and you look up Dragonfly Quilt Works, uh, in her shop, she usually has those in stock. I haven't checked recently, but um, do we have a link that we can share? Okay, yeah, so if we get the link, we'll put it in the description box below. But um, you, you can just look for it at Dragonfly Quilt Works. She has like little glue tips in her thing, maybe in the Notion section or tools section of her Etsy shop. And they come in super handy because they help you control how much glue is coming out. So when you're using it for glue basting, it's just, you know, a couple little dots here and there. You don't really want to be like squeezing the regular tip off the Elmer's glue bottle for sure. Okay. Let's see. Okay. And yes, Julie was asking, was the casing two inches? Yes, the, the strip started off as the two inches and then we ended up folding it in half. Okay. So now we're going to baste the casings into place. And for that, I'm just gonna use an eighth of an inch seam allowance. Technically, you could also use a quarter of an inch seam allowance. You just want it to be smaller than the main seam allowance that we'll be using in the project, which is three eighths. So just something narrower than that. And again, the stitch length can be longer, doesn't really matter. This is just to basically hold this in place. And I am gonna go back and do a few back stitches there, just so I don't have to worry about you know, the end coming apart or anything in between now and the full stitching of it. 
And just stop and make sure if you need to that it's aligned with the raw edges. And then I'll backstitch here as well. And then let's do the same steps to the other one. This is going to be a good size. I think even for like a project bag for knitting a hat or something. Back stitch. Remember we're using an eighth of an inch seam allowance. Yeah, it is a long link. Etsy has those long links. So we went ahead and put the link to the glue tip in the um, chat box below. If you're watching on Facebook and YouTube, it should be there. Back stitch on the opposite end as well. Okay, a couple steps down. Now we need to start constructing it together. So we have this, this, and the two lining pieces, okay? Next step is to take one lining piece and flip it pretty sides touching on each of the two halves that you made here. So pretty side of the lining facing down, match everything up and put a couple pins. We'll put the pins just across the top because that's where we need to sew first. So that's there, pretty side face down. And one tip also, <coughs> excuse me, if you don't have the fashion fuse, uh, the woven, <coughs> the woven interfacing, uh, fusible interfacing, you can also just start your fabric and that would work. <clears throat> okay, so I was saying that you could um, just starch the fabric. What we want is to add a little bit more body to the fabric so it doesn't have to be interfaced, but it does help. Okay, next is 3 eighths of an inch seam allowance and we're stitching just along the straight edges. This is what catches the casing in between the exterior and the lining fabrics. So for this, I am going to drop the stitch length to 2.4. Between 2 and 2.5 is fine. And then I said the true seam allowance is 3 eighths of an inch. So that's what I'm aligning my fabric with. And we do want to back stitch at the beginning and end. So right here. <laughs> PJ says breathe, we will wait, okay? Guess what happened just now? I got into my quilter mode and I just automatically went to a quarter of an inch seam allowance. But three eighths is what I should be doing here, which I realigned it just now, so that should be okay. Does that ever happen to you where you're like, don't even measure and you just look at it and your eyeballs can tell? That's not the right seam allowance. I should be at a quarter inch, my quilter hat on. <laughs> Donna says, you're so funny, choking and laughing. That's what I do. Even when I fall, I laugh. <laughs> it's like you can barely breathe, but you're like continuing to laugh to make it even worse, right? All right, three-eighths of an inch. And see, this is a cool beginner project too because there are a few steps, right, involved in making it, but they're short and sweet. So if you're teaching a kid or a child, a teen, or just somebody who's new to sewing, break it up into different sessions. You know, we're going to cut everything out. Done. We're going to make and turn and press the, the casings. Done. Right? There's a lot of places to stop and break this up into multiple lessons. And when they are sewing, it's just like one straight seam. Stop. One straight seam. Stop. Right? But then we're going to deal with curves in a second. So let me make sure I did all of this. So you can press this. I'm just going to continue to go on with the steps, but you get it. We have exterior, we have the casing coming out, and then we have the lining. We're going to open these guys up, 
And I want you to align things pretty sides together with both halves, but you got to match them up. So lining is with lining and exterior is with exterior, unless you wanted it to be the other way, right? But I'm going to keep it like this so that both of my exteriors are the interfaced ones with the little thread spools. So the key place to place uh, your pins is going to be at the side intersections. Let's grab a couple pins. <clears throat> All right, right here. And what I'm doing with the seam allowance is I'm just going to push one seam allowance in one direction and one to the other. It's not that bulky because it's just fabric with one layer of, of the cotton interfacing for each of the exteriors. But if it was really bulky, I mean, then you really would want to make sure that you had, you know, one seam allowance going one way and one the other. All right, so I'm going to do this here. Put another pin. And now before we start sewing, remember we need an opening. We need to leave a hole in the lining. Now, if you've been following me for years, you know I always say, always leave your opening on a straight side. But if we look at this project, we have no straight sides, right? Everything is a curve, so you really can't get away from it. You're just gonna have to leave an opening. Leave a smaller one. I think on this smaller pouch I left maybe like a two to three inch opening. This is a little bit bigger. So you just have to leave an opening big enough for what you think it will take for you to flip this size of a pouch out through. Because it's just fabric, there's nothing like fusible fleece or something fluffy and thick that will give us a problem. I still think maybe three to four inches would be plenty to turn this out when we're done. So what I'm going to do is just mark. Maybe I won't start that high. Maybe here. And if I turn it onto my cutting mat, and that's the little mark. I can see one box is one inch, this is two inch, three inch, four inch. I'll probably just stop right here. Okay, so something like this big of a chunk is plenty for us to, to leave the opening. <coughs> I hope I don't stop. ate all of them okay um so we're here we have our opening let's start sewing we're going to start sewing on one of the marks on one end i'm going to come to here and i'm just going to walk you through it because it's, it's tricky to see like at the sewing machine let me grab my pointing knitting needle here to show you where we're going to pivot so you always start on one side of your opening mark right so i'm going to start here back stitch to secure that then I'm going to come to here to where I see my seam line where that pin is, is the side intersection of the two fabrics. So I'm going to stop with the needle in the project and down. It's going to hold my spot because you see how this curves in and then it goes opposite direction. So we need to stop here with the needle in the project. Then I'm going to lift my presser foot up and pivot it so that I can position this new curve so that I start sewing this way. Okay. And this is the exterior fabric. So then we're going to sew all the way around here. <clears throat> we're going to come here to the opposite side, do the same thing at that intersection. Stop at that stitch line where I see it with the needle down in the project, lift my presser foot up. I'm going to slightly pivot and then we're going to be stitching on the lining side of things. So we're going to keep everything aligned, go all the way around, and then you're going to stop on the other mark that you made. So that will give us one continuous seam line that holds all the pieces together except for this little bit, which is exactly what we want. You want to have an opening in between these two spots, okay? And then remember that you're always back stitching at the beginning and at the end here. All right? So let's go for it. I was going to start sewing just then, but I don't want people thinking, well, hey, you didn't put any more pins. I just went for it and everything was off. So if you feel like you need the pins, go ahead and put them. That'll just help you keep all the raw edges, you know, better aligned for sewing. I'll put a couple here. If everything is cut pretty accurately, usually you'll find, especially on the side that has the interfacing, it's a little bit more stabilized, so you probably will find that you don't really need pins. But on the side that doesn't have anything, because the curve is all bias cut fabric, if you're someone who tends to be really rough with the fabric as you're feeding it through the sewing machine and you're kind of yanking and stretching it, you're going to fully distort this cut. So be careful. And if you know that that's you, then the two things I mentioned earlier, you may want to also interface the lining fabric because that will help stabilize it. And if not, 
starch the fabric before you cut the pieces out. That will also thicken it up, right? Make it a little bit stiffer and that will help stabilize it as well. Cause remember this is all bias cut and we know that stuff that's cut on the bias way, you know, stretches way too much. Okay. All right. Let's see. Oh, Donna says she recently bought some drawstrings. She said, I might just have to make this. It's super, super. I mean, they're cute little projects, right? Especially if you, like, again, you break it up into steps. If you cut a bunch of the templates out ahead of time, make a couple of the different casings, then you can play like a mix and match game with what casing fabrics to use, with what lining, exterior, super fun. Um, do you know how much the Martelli mat is in pounds? Like 11 pounds yeah, I, I want to say from my memory, I recall maybe it being like 10 or 11 pounds, but I'm not sure as far as shipping, you know, in the box that it comes in and it ships in, but we'll check for you, uh, Prudence or not Prudence, uh, Leanna. Okay. Okay. So here we go. We're going to start on the, here, the lining side. So now a bag making tip is that if you are, if you cut the same matching size dimensions and pieces for exterior parts of a bag and the lining side of a bag, if you want the lining to fit nicer inside of the exterior, okay, you, we often share the tip to sew a larger seam allowance on the lining pieces. So it might be a little bit too much for some of you if you may be a beginner, so don't worry too much about it, but I am going to walk you through what it is that I'm doing. So I have my stitch length set to 2.4. And I'm going to move my needle position over. Oops, that's not the needle position. It's this one. So there I am. I have my needle set there to where it's at the quarter of an inch seam allowance. Okay. You usually will go bigger because I'm starting off in the lining section. I'm going to actually position my needle back in the middle. I'm going to use a three. Let's see. Let's do a half inch or five eighths of an inch even seam allowance because I want to see if I can give you a dramatic result so you get the, what I'm trying to explain that it will um, make the lining basically what you're doing is you're eating more of the fabric in the lining so that when it sits inside of the exterior right as it's sitting inside and you're looking at the lining it it needs to be smaller so that it's not the exact same size as the exterior because otherwise if you've ever made a bag or a tote where like the inside lining is really pooled in there and there's like a bunch of wrinkles and stuff it's because you likely use the same seam allowance on the exterior pieces and the lining pieces so I did five eighths of an inch seam allowance in the lining and I'm coming over there's my line I'm stopping with the needle down like I said take out that pin I'm going to lift the presser foot up and I'm going to pivot. So now I'm on the exterior and the exterior, I want it to be the regular seam allowance, which for this project, I set it to be three eighths of an inch. Okay. So I'm aligning the edge of my fabric to where I see three eighths. And now for curves, it's all in this movement right here, my left hand. So you'll see, I don't even really use my right hand when I'm sewing curves. See if like that, you can see it better. I'm going to take out this pin and notice where my hand is the positioning. And so I start kind of an exaggerated turn this way so that I can do this as I feed it through. And what I'm doing is just turning slightly and at the same time, keeping my eye on the three eighths of an inch line on the metal throat plate here, because that's the guide I'm following for that seam allowance. Okay. So you see how fast I can do it. It's because I know exactly what I'm doing, right? But if you're not, just go slower, you know, lower the speed and you want to still do it in a, wow, that's too slow. <laughs> you want to still do it in a smooth motion because if you try to sew like a little bit straight and then turn a little bit and then a little bit straight, it's going to be super choppy. You're not going to get a rounded seam. Okay. And we do want a rounded seam because that's the shape of the bag. And I'm sorry y'all, but I cannot go slow. I get anxiety when I'm like, come on, come on, come on, hurry it up. All right. So it's three eighths of an inch, the seam allowance for the main body, the exterior pieces. Okay. So now I'm going to slow it down a little bit. I'm going to still at that seam allowance and one more stitch there down with the needle, lift my presser foot up because now I need to scoot it this way. And then remember that on the lining, I said, go a little bit bigger. And I was using five eighths of an inch, which is a lot a bit bigger. <laughs> but I want y'all to see. So five eighths for me is here. Is that right? Yeah, I think so. 
it's so funny because it looks so big. When you're a quilter and your eyes get accustomed to a quarter of an inch, it's like you see half an inch and you're like, whoa, that's huge, right? <laughs> and I feel like people who sew clothes, they're used to the bigger seam allowances. So when we tell them quarter of an inch in quilting, they're just like, oh my gosh, I feel like the fabric moves on me. There's not enough fabric to stitch on. It's all about how your brain is trained, right? So we're still at 5.8. This might have been a little bit much exaggerated, but I'll show y'all. I can see my blue mark is coming up, so I'm just going to go up to that point. And right there, I'm in line with the blue mark. I'm going to backstitch a bit, remember? Backstitch to secure it. And now, because we cut everything on curves, 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 especially the exterior on the interface side, I said it's not that bulky, but for curves, there's going to be a lot more excess fabric in this area to push out and give it a nice curve. So we do need to trim that up. You can trim it with regular scissors, a rotary cutter. Let me grab my pinking shears. Now I don't even know which ones work these days. There's always going to be a better pair than the other, but let's see. These are Fiskars. And so what I'm going to do is trim away some of the excess seam allowance. This is on the exterior side. If you don't have pinking shears, you can always, takes forever though, but you can cut little notches with your own scissors. Or sometimes I've been known to just cut it like smooth with the rotary cutter, just cutting it closer so that I only have about a quarter of an inch in the seam allowance instead of the full amount that we sewed. Now when I get to the corners here, I just kind of stop off the edge, okay? Same thing here, we'll trim a little bit more, not much. And then in the lining area, same thing. What you don't want to do is cut away the excess fabric in the portion that we've left unsewn, okay? Leave that like that. And oh, you know what? I started way over here. That was that initial mark that I made that I was like, oh no, that's kind of too close to the top. Let me just catch up. I should have started here instead of the second mark. Same difference. I just backstitch at the beginning and end. Perfect. Okay. That's better. This is what I meant. We just have this opening. Okay. So I need to trim away some of the excess in the lining area as well. Let's go ahead and pick up here. I'm starting on one side of where the mark is. And this just reduces the bulk of the fabric and helps that fabric that's cut on a curve on full bias edge like this to lie a little bit better on the inside. And they sell the blades, like you can um, attach a, a pinking blade to your rotary cutter so that you just go whoop, and do that too. There's a lot of different options for this, but notice I'm just trimming away up until my mark. Let me see if I can show you that. So I've trimmed here and I trimmed here, but in this area I left it because that will need to be turned under. So if you cut away the seam allowance you have there, it's going to be tight to close it up. So now let's reach in here, let's grab our pressing mat. <clears throat> I'm going to flip this whole thing right side out. And then you would just, you know, give this a good press, make sure everything is shaped the way you want it to. You can always go back in and like re-trim it up or use the pinking shears to clean up those seam allowances if you see that it's not a nice curve. here. How cute with the little thread spools. So without a press, this is what it looks like. So you would just align everything in there and give it a press. Okay. Nice and flat. And then we're gonna, you know, you would go in, of course, and close up the um, opening. To do that, you can do it by hand, or I often will just tug with my pointer fingers on each end, get those raw edges to turn under, like that. Put a couple of pins and then just top stitch it at the machine to secure it closed. So that's how I would finish that opening. And then we're going to make the drawstring closure right now, which I'm actually going to do on this smaller one that's already been done because the pieces are already cut to size. I'll show you how to measure so that if you are following along with some of the tips that I shared today and you're cutting, you know, you're, you're making a different size to the pouch, 
and you need to figure out how long to cut your drawstring to, this is what you want to do. Once the pouch is done, measure once across here, extending about two inches on either side, once and twice. Okay? So two inches plus this measurement plus another two inches times two is the length of one, and you're going to need to cut two to that size, and that's what's going to give us the fully functioning drawstring that we need for here. Now, uh, after uh, one of the other Whip Wednesdays that we had last year, somebody recommended this clip and glide bodkin. I think several of you said that you had it. So we went ahead and ordered some. We have them in stock. I know some of you already went ahead and made the purchase, but this little thing is so handy. Look how flexible it is. It's by Clover. It's a Nancy Zeman product, I believe. And it allows you to not have to use a safety pin. And if you've ever pushed a safety pin with elastic or ribbon or anything in a drawstring, you know that sometimes when you're feeding it through, you press it by mistake and it opens. And that is just a nightmare to deal with. So this little thing solves that. We are going to take our drawstring. Let me get rid of this yellow thing. I think this is the ref like the color of that may be messing with us. So it has a white clip here. When you lift that up, it releases the bite on the opposite end of the bodkin. And you know what? Let me see if I can... Oh, maybe that's better. I just want y'all to see because the pieces are kind of small. All right, maybe that works here. So I lift up the white clip and that releases this here, like a little snake mouth, okay? I'm going to take the end of whatever you're pushing through your drawstring and we're gonna place it on the little mouth and the green end there. And it kind of has these little plastic teeth. So you wanna make sure that you insert it so that it grabs that. And that way it will ensure that it won't come out on you. So I just put a little bit in like that, pinch it down with my hand to hold it. And then when you press the white clip down, it's already chomped it down, okay? So it's in there. And now I just take the finer tip. I'm gonna push it through my casing. And this is one thing I wanted to show y'all, that even though the, this part of it is a little bit chunky, if you follow the measurements that I use in the seam allowances to create the casings for these pouches, it still fits in here. That's what you have to think about though. If you're making a project that has like a narrower casing of a quarter inch or three eighths inch or something, just be mindful that this part of the whole contraption may not fit. But for me, it does. And so you just pull here. I need to go. I went in through one side of the casing came out the other and I'm going to reinsert it to the other, the other casing and pull it here. I love that this bit right here where it's flexible and it's still like a stiffer tip so that you can kind of work your way in through casings, but then it's really pliable to go around the corners. Okay. So then when I come out on this side, I just lift up the white clip and it releases it and we'll tie an overhand knot with both ends. <coughs> And that's the end of that one. We're gonna repeat the same thing, going in and coming out of the opposite side. And that's it. I think this is like way faster <laughs> than the safety pin. And it just gives us one more gadget to add to our stash. Okay, so that's one. I'm gonna do the same thing again. So white clip up, releases this part, insert it. I hold it with my finger so that it's still in position for when I press the white clip on it, okay? And then we're going to go in through one side. So easy and fun. And it's like a little, it's less than $7, the tool, like six something. So then we'll again, lift up the white clip, release it and take both ends and tie them into one overhand knot. So if you're going to be making a ton of these, I think it's way easier and, um, more fun than using a safety pin. So there it is, and that's how you cinch it up, okay? So that's what I'll be working on. I need to cut the um, drawstring here, and I'm just using this hooked, this is Ribbon XL yarn that I had in my stash. Um, I think I have a link under the tutorial on where I got it. They call it like t-shirt yarn, ZZ something. It's like under all kinds of names, but it's just basically like stretch knit fabric and uh, like in a, in a drawstring form. So it's fun for these types of projects. So again, what I would measure for this is, and it doesn't have to be exactly two inches, it can be a little bit more, right? So two to three inches bigger, two to three inches bigger here, and then I would just run a double piece like that. 
And once I do one, I pull out some more. I'm going to measure the second one like this. So then I have my two drawstrings, okay? So I've gone over how to use a plate as a template, how to measure down, how to cut the clean edge off the top, making your casing, the dimensions and stuff to use, how to measure and figure out how long you want the drawstring cording to be, and how to use the little bodkin to put it in, right? To insert your casing. So super, super cool. Jackie says, link for the new tool <clears throat> is in the description box below. We've put it in the chat. And again, it's also under the featured tab of our online shop. So craftygemini.com slash shop. I do love that this thing is flexible. If you make garments or if you've made what, which projects to see my Hoya drawstring bag that we did for the seventh edition bag club, even the Flagler drawstring backpack, anything that says drawstring, this will help you. So if you sew a lot of clothes and you do like elastic drawstring skirts and stuff like that, super, super handy as well. Just remember that whatever the casing size is needs to accommodate this chunk. So if you have a casing that's narrower than this and it won't fit, then, you know, you want to fall back to your safety pin method. OK, let's see. Tracy's asking, do they have pinking shears for the Fiskars rotary cutter? So you're meaning like a, a pinking blade. I'm pretty sure they do. I don't use Fiskars rotary cutters. I have mostly Ulfa ones. And I know that they do sell the the pinking shear blade for or the pinking blade. I should say not shears. Yep. Oh, Charity says it's one of the tools that she uses a lot in her projects. That's good to know. Maybe you were one of the ones that mentioned it last time. When they see me using a safety pin, they're like, hey, have you tried the clip and glide bodkin? Um, okay. I'm making sure I'm not missing anything else. Oh, awesome. Diana says, great project. She's in the mood to sew again. That always helps when you get your sojo, right? Your sewing mojo back. I'm just going to keep working on this because when I get this far in a project, I really just need to finish it. So let me give this a quick press. Make sure that you always press your stuff because it kind of looks rolled up and you see it's not like fully flat. I mean, it looks okay, but you definitely want to um, give everything a good press so your projects look polished. But this is what I wanted to show you, even though I haven't closed the opening there. Remember we were talking about how that seam allowance was pretty big at five eighths of an inch? That lining fits perfectly in there. Okay? It's not super duper wrinkled. So you can imagine if I would have used the same seam allowance as I used for the exterior fabric side of the construction step, this would be way more wrinkled on the inside. Now for something like this, I also like to press it like that, like from the top edge on the inside, not just pressing from here. You want to break your projects up and press it in different sections. I have my clapper. Opposite side. This is going to be a super cute one. And again, you can put anything in these. I mean, it's kind of like a zippered pouch. You can never have too many zippered pouches. All right, so now that those top edges are crisp, I'm going to align everything down, and then we'll go ahead and give this a good steam and press around the outer edges. Yes. Whoop. Not burn myself. Okay. Okay, now that it's... Can you see that? That lining looks... Ah perfection in there. So that is what I wanted to show you. And I was thinking it might have been like a little bit too exaggerated, but you can see if you use a 3 8 inch uh, seam allowance on the exterior side, go with a 5 8 inch. It might look huge like it did for me, but once it's all said and done, look how nice that lining looks. I mean, oh, love it. So I need to pull out the lining and actually um, close up the opening in here, but I'm going to go ahead and do that off camera. And then I'll share a picture with y'all of it, of the finished bag with y'all on my Facebook page once I'm done with this. And actually this yarn too, because I was pulling it off of a roll. I need to steam this a little bit just to give it a little bit <laughs> of a cleaner finish because you can see how wrinkled it is. But I hope that with this demo, you all learned a couple tips, learned how to make this bigger, learned some kind of design elements to go along with it so that you can make my little round drawstring pouch your own based on the fun fabrics that you have in your stash and on whatever plates or saucers you want to use to make it in different sizes. All right. Thanks everybody for tuning in for another episode of Whip Wednesday. I will be back next Wednesday 
with Whip Wednesday 56. Now, if you're new here and you're not familiar with these Whip Wednesdays, Whip basically stands for work in progress. And what I do is some type of a demo, a tutorial, some tips and tricks and things like that every Wednesday at 1 p.m. Eastern right here on the Crafty Gemini YouTube channel and the Crafty Gemini Facebook page. So we're always featuring new items, things that we carry in our shop, courses and stuff like that. So if you are looking for just a fun, you know, little sewing chat and demo every Wednesday at 1 p.m. Eastern. You can join us here. And I would highly recommend that you add yourself to our email newsletter list because that is where we send all the updates. We send emails with links to every Whip Wednesday every week. Uh, and you can do that by going to craftygemini.com and you'll see a little pop-up box for adding yourself to the email newsletter. Okay, so that is the number one best way to stay in tune with all the Crafty Gemini stuff that's going on. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for tuning in. Have a great rest of your week, and I'll see you next Wednesday. Bye.